Hey everyone, thanks for your time. This video will cover information that NASA provided about the status of Artemis II launch preparations during the past week. Optimistically, the mission is still likely a year away, but NASA isn't quite ready to set a specific target launch date. Right now it's the combination of no later than and April 2026. It's still hard to tell how optimistic we should be about the schedule, but I'll dig into those details and the imagery that was provided during the past week. I also got a few updates about SLS production for Artemis 3 and 4, and I'll put those into some perspective. Some of the information from NASA and its Artemis contractors came during a trade show during the past week, and so there's a few things to point out there. And then there was another instance where NASA got pulled into the continuous political soap opera of the time. First, let's start with an update on Artemis 2 preparations as they stand at the end of January, beginning February 2025. NASA provided some situational updates during the past week via public affairs and at a trade show in Orlando, Florida. Imagery of the lift of the SLS Solid Rocket Booster left-hand center center segment with its distinctive NASA worm logo painted on the case was posted by Kennedy Space Center PAO at the end of this past week. The segment was lifted and mated over the last weekend of January 25th and 26th. That makes four segments stacked on the right-hand booster, and now three segments stacked on the left-hand booster. In follow-ups with KSC PAO, Exploration Ground Systems noted that they pressed ahead with stacking right-hand segments while they worked on unspecified issues with the left side. Even though there was a plan to alternate back and forth between the left and right, there was always flexibility to stack the segments and assemblies in a different sequence. So the sequence so far was the left aft assembly followed by the right aft assembly, then the left aft center segment followed by the right aft center segment. But then the next two segments were on the right hand booster, the right center center followed by the right forward center segment. Now with the left center center segment stacked, there are three more motor segments left, the right forward segment and the left forward center and forward segments. After that, the forward assemblies will top out the boosters, and then EGS and Amentum, the Consolidated Operations Management Engineering and Test Contract Prime, Comet for short, will integrate the avionics and mechanical systems in the boosters by closing out the wire harness runs from the forward assemblies at the top to the aft skirts at the bottom where the hydraulic thrust vector control equipment is located. If we go back to the time-lapse video that KSC Public Affairs released on January 30th, we can see in the background the core stage ground carrier equipment is again positioned to support the eventual lift and mating to the boosters in High Bay 3. In these shots, they are set up in front of High Bay 2, where the core is currently being serviced in the core stage vertical integration center. The stage will go through two breakover and lift operations to get it from High Bay 2 to High Bay 3. First, it will be lifted out of High Bay 2 and laid down on the carrier equipment, officially known as the Multipurpose Transportation System, or MPTS. The MPTS will be driven with the stage over in front of High Bay 3, so that the second of two 325-ton cranes can be used for that lift. KSC Public Affairs provided a little more information this past week about the status of upcoming Artemis II integration milestones. They reaffirmed that the mate of the core stage with the boosters is still tracking for March. They also reaffirmed that transportation of the Artemis II Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS, was still tracking for this month of February now. It is currently stored in the United Launch Alliance Delta Operations Center on the Cape Canaveral side of the NASA Causeway, and it will be moved from there to the multi-payload processing facility in the KSC industrial area for hydrazine fueling. ICPS uses hydrazine as a monopropellant for its Attitude Control System, or ACS. I asked about Orion assembly and test status, and specifically about installation of the solar array wings, and PAO says that is currently planned for March. That is obviously a major milestone since it will signify that Lockheed Martin is in the home stretch of its work. There were a couple of additional schedule updates provided at the Spacecom Expo in Orlando at a panel there on January 29th. As reported on social media by Spaceflight Now, 
Most critically is that Lockheed Martin is targeting April for handover of Orion to EGS spacecraft and offline operations, which will then take it and go through launch processing. The other schedule update was that the SLS tanking test before Artemis II was targeting the fall, but that's still dependent on a pending decision on whether to do that test with or without Orion. Both of those schedule dates are consistent with what we heard from NASA and contractor officials in mid-December at the KSC media event. SLS stacking up through the ICPS would run into April. That would be followed by mating all the mobile launcher umbilicals, and then integrated test and checkout of the rocket with the ground launch control system would run through most of the summer, leading to readiness of at least SLS to roll out for a tanking test in the fall. The Orion schedule was and is a little less clear, but we now have the target of April for the handover, which would coincide with moving the short stack from the ONC building to the MPPF. After that, it's unclear what the current forecast is for Orion being ready to stack in the VAB on SLS. Loading propellants and other fluid commodities on the spacecraft in the MPPF is expected to take a few months, and then a couple more months in the launch abort system facility for stacking the LAS on top of the crew module, and then encapsulating it with the OGI panels. Boeing provided a few updates on the production of Core Stage 3 elements and on welding of the structures for Core Stage 4. Just a reminder, the other parts of SLS are contracted and produced separately. Northrop Grumman has already cast and produced the solid rocket booster segments for not just Artemis 3, but also Artemis 4. Similarly, L3 Harris has the RS-25 adaptation engines in storage for Artemis 3 and Artemis 4. Those are basically the remaining space shuttle main engines with the engine controller upgrade that was completed in the last decade. The connectors for Artemis 3 are also complete. Teledyne Brown Engineering has finished the launch vehicle stage adapter, and NASA Marshall Space Flight Center builds the Orion stage adapter connector between the United Launch Alliance Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage and Orion. Boeing is responsible for the core stage, which is the centerpiece of the launch vehicle. It is not just where the other hardware elements are connected and the propulsion systems are integrated, it is also where the flight control system resides. So it's the most complicated element and the only significant new build in the vehicle, and NASA and Boeing are still working through growing pains trying to stabilize and increase production. That's one of the reasons why it trails the other SLS elements for a particular launch, such as for Artemis III. For that Artemis III build, Core Stage 3, the engine section is in its integration phase of standalone subassembly, the home of which is now the Space Systems Processing Facility at the Kennedy Space Center. The bow tail was attached last fall, and Boeing is working to finish installing all the wiring, complete all the orbital tube welding, and install all the main propulsion system or MPS equipment inside. The other two dry structures, the forward skirt and the inner tank, are sitting in their integration tooling at the Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans. Those two elements will eventually be mated to the liquid oxygen tank first, and then the liquid hydrogen tank will be mated to the aft end of the inner tank. Right now we're waiting to see when the liquid hydrogen or LH2 tank will complete its spray-on foam insulation applications in cell N at MAF. After repairs to that Sophie spray cell, the latest update was that foam sprays would begin around the end of January, which is a few week delay from the last forecast. The liquid oxygen or LOX tank was now said to be in the adjacent production cell, cell P. That is where a coat of primer is sprayed on the exterior of the tank. The latest update was those primer sprays were expected to begin at the end of January and would be complete in the spring. In terms of forward outlook for the build, we will be watching to see when the propellant tanks exit cell N. The forecast last fall was for the aft join in the early summer, basically mid-year, followed by the forward join later in the summer. That was before Artemis III was delayed to mid-2027, though. It's not clear whether the contract dates for SLS and Orion have been revised to the new target launch date or not. Similarly, we'll be watching to see progress with completing standalone integration of the engine section in Florida. Once the engine section is outfitted, standalone integrated functional testing of all the MPS equipment and avionics would begin. So to help summarize this, I modified these old NASA presentation slides for an overview of where the Core Stage 3 build is for the five major elements. Work on each of them is still standalone, 
The major joins are forecast later this year. For the forward join elements, the forward skirt and inner tank are finishing up their integration, waiting for the liquid oxygen tank. That is expected to begin primer applications in cell P any time now, and then will go to cell N for its foam sprays. That's where the liquid oxygen tank currently is, and following the repairs to cell N that took it offline for most of last year, foam sprays are supposed to begin also any time now. For the Artemis 4 build, core stage 4, that engine section is in an earlier phase of integration, also in the SSPF in Florida. The rest of the stage elements are still in structural assembly. The inner tank structure is complete, but the forward skirt and the propellant tanks still need to complete their welding. The forward skirt was scheduled to be the first element through the vertical assembly center, or VAC. The barrel was welded a long time ago, way back in September of 2022. The two remaining welds are L-rings to the top and bottom of the barrel. Those form the bolted flanges with the bottom one connecting to the core stage liquid oxygen tank and the top one, for Artemis 4 connecting to the new inner stage connector with the expiration upper stage or EUS. The update was that the forward L-ring to barrel weld was complete and the barrel to aft L-ring weld was in progress. Last fall, the forecast was then for the core stage 4 LH2 tank to be welded in the VAC, followed by the EUS LH2 tank structural test article, then followed by the core stage 4 LOX tank. We'll have to see if the traffic flow through the tool has been revised or not. The constituent elements of the core stage 4 propellant tanks, the barrels and domes, are ready to be welded in the VAC with one exception, the aft dome of the LH2 tank. NASA posted some reference shots of part of that, taken back in November. These images show the gore body being lifted into the circumferential dome welding tool, or CDWT. The Y-ring is already installed, and those two elements would be welded first. Later, the end cap would be installed in the tool to do the final dome weld between the end cap and the gore body. Boeing says that this LH2 aft dome is scheduled to be completed in March. The core stage LH2 tanks have five barrels and two domes, and it is welded in the VAC from top to bottom. In the past, Boeing has started welding the LH2 tank with the forward dome, followed by barrels one through five, while the aft dome was still being completed. Again, looking at these old NASA presentation slides that I've modified, we can get a little bit of an overview of the work necessary for each of the five major elements and where the fourth build is. The engine section is started well in advance for core stage builds now, given it is the most complicated of the five elements. And so that's already in Florida and into its integration phase. The rest of the elements are still in structural assembly. After the forward skirt L-ring welds are completed, the weld lands and the rings will be sprayed with primer, and then the barrel will be sprayed with foam. The inner tank structure is the only one without welds, and those bolted panels and thrust beam already have their primer coat. It will head to a foam spray cell for a multi-layer application to the exterior of the barrel. The two propellant tanks are awaiting their structural assembly in the VAC when their turn comes in the tool. Boeing is also assembling EUS structures for a structural test article and the flight article for Artemis 4, so that traffic pattern through the tool may be adjusted again. On Thursday, January 30th, NASA published a couple of pictures of the Artemis II crew visit to the SSPF from a couple of weeks earlier on January 16th. The engine sections for Core Stage 3 and Core Stage 4 are background subjects in the pictures, but these are interesting views both up close and inside the Core Stage 3 unit. In the first image, we see Artemis II Prime crew members Jeremy Hansen and Christina Cook right next to the minus Z side of the Core Stage 3 unit, with the side access doorway in view in the lower left. The Core Stage 4 engine section is in the background in this view. The second image is unique, again, for what's in the background. This is a very rare view inside a Core Stage engine section. This is the Core Stage unit for Artemis III again. We can see a lot of wire harness runs, some of which have been installed and connected, but a lot of them are situated for future layout and connection. 
We can also see one of the work platforms that the crew and Boeing representative are standing on, and in the background we can see a little bit of the backside of the two tail service mast umbilical plates and where the zero degree locks feed line slash downcomer enters the engine section. Obviously that zero degree feed line Y duct has not been installed yet. Most of the work in the engine section is below the platform where the thrust structure and the thrust vector control or TVC platforms are. In other news and notes for the week, the first NASA related political move of President Trump's second term was unexpectedly about the International Space Station. Elon Musk and Trump decided to relitigate the Boeing Starliner crewed flight test decisions on social media in a staged call and response. If it weren't about the ISS or NASA, it might not be newsworthy. Trump is leaving plenty of receipts for highly political executive orders in other departments, so this was a good reminder to look for those receipts in writing after any initial social media postings. In this case, the broadcast text exchange between Musk and Trump was a non sequitur. With respect to possible changes to Artemis and its currently funded programs, it's something else to keep in mind. Rhetorically, now that the administration has put their hands on ISS crew rotations and safety, does it mean if the Starliner astronauts have to stay that Trump and Musk stranded them there for a couple more months? Guess we'll see. There were a few more Artemis news items provided at that Spacecom Expo in Orlando at another January 29th panel. First, as reported on social media by Jeff Faust, was that the SpaceX Dragon XL spacecraft design has changed significantly and contract modifications are in work. We'll see if or when SpaceX discloses details about the new design and whether NASA is willing to provide more information after the contract modifications are completed and signed. And then there were a couple of new details about the Starship HLS Option A uncrewed lunar landing demonstration. NASA had previously noted that a lunar ascent test objective was added to that uncrewed demo, but now they are saying that ascent test objective would occur a few hours after landing. The other detail was that the HLS prototype would then attempt to land again after lifting off the surface, kind of like a hop. Presumably the engines will fire for some number of seconds, but will not attempt a long enough burn to reach low lunar orbit insertion. So those two parameters would be different than what will be necessary for the crewed lunar landing demonstration that is a part of the Artemis 3 mission. In that case, the Starship HLS spacecraft ascent would occur after about a week on the surface. And of course, the ascent will require its own set of long duration burns to get back to Orion in near rectilinear halo orbit. As it does going back to earlier in the mission, where Starship first would travel from the Earth to NRHO, and then another set of long duration burns for descent from there to the lunar surface. Speaking of the RS-25 engines, L3 Harris has restarted manufacturing all the engine components for flight engines that are assigned to the fifth core stage and presumably the Artemis V launch. However, they will also serve as spare flight engines for the Artemis IV vehicle and launch. L3 Harris noted this past week that the RS-25 restart engines completed their design certification review last July. Those engines use more modern manufacturing techniques than the Space Shuttle main engines, which mostly ended production back around the turn of the century. The new flight engines have much the same form, fit, and function, but are now certified with upgraded performance on the one hand, but also for single flight use on the other hand. Thanks as always for watching. Click on the like button if you found this video informative. While we watch solid rocket booster stacking progress, we'll also be watching to see in the next few weeks about disclosure of that work to date for Artemis 2 that was teased at the Spacecom Expo.